Hello and welcome to Zoology 142 Online. This is the lecture on human development, pregnancy, and parturition. Today we're going to cover topics such as fertilization, the embryonic and fetal periods, and also pregnancy and labor. Okay, before we get started on today's lecture, we're going to cover a little bit of vocabulary. The first of the words is pregnancy, which you're probably familiar with. Pregnancy is all the events that occur from the time of fertilization until parturition, that is when the infant is born. The conceptus is the developing offspring, that is the fertilized egg from the minute of fertilization all the way up until we have labor and birth. The gestation period is the time from the last menstrual period until birth, around 280 days and the embryo is the conceptus from the time of fertilization through week 8. And finally, a fetus is the conceptus from week 9 through the time of birth. Okay, this slide just shows an overview of the events that are going to happen during pregnancy. And remember, pregnancy is about 280 days. We're going to start out with a fertilized egg, which is known as a zygote. And this zygote is going to drift freely throughout the fallopian tubes for a few days. And by the end of the first week, it's going to start implanting into the uterus of the female. And probably by the end of three weeks, we are well on our way to placentation. That is forming a connection to exchange nutrients between the embryo and the mother's circulation. And then finally, at the end of eight weeks, we have transitioned from an embryonic phase to the fetal phase. It's important to realize that all the major organ systems are basically laid down during the first eight weeks, that is during the embryonic period, and that the fetal period just involves growth and development of those organ systems. Okay, just a reminder that pregnancy lasts about 38 to 40 weeks, and that the first eight weeks of this is going to be the embryonic period. We're going to go from having a fertilized egg that will then go through the process of cleavage and divide into smaller and smaller cells. And eventually, we're going to get something that looks like the picture at right. Uh, this is an embryo, probably around five to six weeks. And so we can see leg buds, arm buds, a tail bud, these pharyngeal gill slits. Uh, at this point, the embryo looks nothing like a baby. And so that's one way to basically discriminate between the two is that embryos look like space aliens and fetuses look like babies. So the fetal period is going to start at around week 9 and proceed through week 38. And we're going to start out with initially a very small fetus that is then going to gain weight and gain length over time so that the newborn or neonate is going to look like a baby and he's not going to look like a sea monkey. Okay, before we can have a fetus or even an embryo, we have to have fertilization take place. And it's important to realize that the gametes, the sperm, and the ova have a very limited lifetime. That is a limited period of viability. The oocyte is only viable for around 12 to 24 hours after ovulation. On the other hand, sperm are a little bit more hardy. They can be viable for up to 48 hours after ejaculation. And what this means is that in order for fertilization to occur, coitus or sexual intercourse must take place in a fairly narrow window. That is up to 48 hours before ovulation to 24 hours after ovulation. And so if this has occurred successfully, the sperm will be meeting the oocyte uh, as it's about one-third the way down the fallopian tube. So fertilization takes place in the fallopian tube, and eventually that fertilized oocyte will move out of the fallopian tube and implant in the superior part of the uterus. Now we're going to focus specifically on the sperm. Remember that sperm enter the female's reproductive tract during sexual intercourse through ejaculation. The sperm and seminal fluid are ejaculated in the vagina, and at some point, some of that fluid is going to move from the vagina up through the cervix, into the uterus, and eventually into the fallopian tubes. Now, one of the ways in which this happens is through something called reverse peristalsis. Basically, the prostaglandins that are in the seminal fluid induce micro-muscle contractions within the female reproductive tract, which helps to move it up towards the fallopian tubes. But of course, the sperm have to do work here as well. They have to be able to swim from the entrance of the fallopian tube all the way up to the ovulated oocyte, which again is usually about one-third of the way down the tube at the time of fertilization. Now, in order for sperm to become modal, they must undergo a process called capacitation. So capacitation involves an increase in the motility of the sperm, so they're able to swim, and it also involves a weakening of basically the membrane around the nucleus of the cell. At the tip of the head of each sperm is a membrane called the archrosome, and the archrosome contains some very powerful hydrolytic enzymes that will be necessary to basically digest their way through the outer covering of the female's oocyte. 
and so initially the archosome has a very tough cap on it and this tough cap will not allow these enzymes to be released. So through the process of capacitation, the female reproductive tract will actually weaken this outer membrane, which will then enable the sperm to release the hydrolytic enzymes at the oocyte at the time of fertilization. Now, if you remember a couple lectures ago, we talked about that each ejaculation is going to typically contain millions and millions of spermatozoa. However, only a few of these spermatozoa are actually going to make it to the location of the ovulated oocyte. And they get there through various chemical cues, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. Uh, they also get there through their swimming motion and the reverse peristalsis uh, that occurs in the female reproductive tract in response to prostaglandins. Now, once they arrive at the oocyte, they're going to have to make it through a couple different layers. The outside layer is called the corona radiata, and this is basically made up of follicular cells that surround the oocyte. Beyond that is the actual shell of the oocyte, which is called the zona pellucida. The zona pellucida is basically a tough acellular protein layer, which the sperm will have to penetrate in order to fertilize the egg and the way that the sperm penetrates this membrane is through releasing its archrosomal enzymes, that is those hydrolytic enzymes that were housed within the tip of the spermatozoa. And these enzymes will digest a hole in the zona pellucida and basically one sperm is not enough to do it. It actually takes hundreds and hundreds of sperm to release their hydrolytic enzymes in order to digest far enough into the zona pellucida so that one sperm can actually fertilize the egg. So in this case, being the first sperm on the scene is not a good idea because chances are you're not going to be able to fertilize that egg. It's only after thousands of these spermatozoa have reached the egg, released their hydrolytic enzymes, that that membrane is going to be thin enough that one lucky sperm is going to be able to secrete a little bit more enzyme and then enter the egg and fertilize it. So now we're going to go look at the process of fertilization in a step-by-step -step fashion. The first process that's going to have to happen, of course, is capacitation. That is where our spermatozoa become activated by secretions of the female reproductive tract. And this helps them to become more modal, able to swim better, and also more able to release their hydrolytic enzymes once they get to the oocyte. So the first part after this capacitation is going to be the approach. The approach of spermatozoa to the egg is going to be aided by various chemical cues. Now, once we get close to that oocyte, the first thing that the spermatozoa is going to have to do is basically burrow its way through the granulosa cells that surround the oocyte. And these granulosa cells are part of the corona radiata. Now, once these spermatozoa make it through the first barrier, that is the granulosa cells of the corona radiata, we then have to make it through a second barrier, and this barrier is the zona pellucida. The zona pellucida is a thick acellular membrane that surrounds the oocyte, or egg. And the way that we make our way through the zona pellucida is by releasing the hydrolytic enzymes from the acrosome. The acrosome was that tip of the spermatozoa that contains very powerful hydrolytic enzymes that will dissolve their way through the zona pellucida. And it's important to remember that we actually need hundreds if not thousands of spermatozoa releasing their hydrolytic enzymes in order for one spermatozoa to be able to eventually fertilize that egg. And so the next step is binding. Once we've had thousands of spermatozoa releasing their hydrolytic enzymes in order to burrow our way through that zona pellucida, eventually one lucky spermatozoa will make it through the zona pellucida and bind to a special receptor called the ZP3 glycoprotein receptor in the zona pellucida. And once this happens, fusion will occur. Basically, the plasma membranes of the sperm and the oocyte will fuse, allowing the contents of the sperm to enter the oocyte. At this point, we will have two reactions that occur to help prevent polyspermy. Polyspermy is basically the process of having multiple sperm fertilize an oocyte. And usually it's something we don't want to have happen because if that happens, we're going to have more chromosomes in that zygote than necessary. And typically that's going to lead to a zygote that is non-viable. And so the first of these blocks to polyspermy is something called the cortical reaction. And this is the fast block to polyspermy because it happens really, really fast.
So what happens here is that once that spermatozoa penetrates the zone of pellucida, there will be a rapid influx of calcium ions, which will cause the cortical granules, which were right below the membrane, to basically destroy all the other ZP3 receptors in the plasma membrane. And that will prevent other sperm from binding. The other block to polyspermia that will occur will be the hardening of the zone of pellucida. And this happens more slowly, and so we say it's a slow block to polyspermy. But basically, both of these methods have evolved to prevent more than one spermatozoa from fertilizing an egg. Because again, if we have more than one spermatozoa fertilizing an egg, we're going to have an egg that has too many chromosomes, and in this case, it will not be able to go through development, it will not be viable, and it will not become an embryo. So this slide just summarizes the total number of events that have to happen in order for sperm to fertilize an ovulated oocyte. The first process was capacitation, that is where we had our spermatozoa basically becoming more modal and also having their outer membranes uh, eaten away a little bit by secretions of the female reproductive tract. Now these spermatozoa are going to eventually make it to the oocyte, at which time they're going to approach the oocyte using chemical cues, and they're going to have to first make it past the corona radiata, which consists of a loose aggregate of granulosa cells. The next part they're going to have to do is basically start to burrow down through the zona pellucida, and in order to do that, they need to release lots of hydrolytic enzymes. And finally, we're going to have one spermatozoa that actually makes it through the zona pellucida, which results in binding of the spermatozoa nucleus and the oocyte nucleus. At that time, we're going to have fusion, and we're going to basically initiate our blocks to polyspermy. Remember, there's a fast block called the cortical reaction, and also a slow block, which involves the hardening of the zona pellucida. So now that the sperm has actually entered the egg, we're going to take a look at the events of fertilization on a microscopic basis. Remember that oocytes really haven't gone through all the meiotic divisions. That is, prior to ovulation, they hadn't even finished meiosis I. At the time of ovulation, we completed the first division, meiosis I, in which we created the first polar body. Now, once we have the sperm bind to the egg, we're then going to resume meiosis, going through meiosis II, and forming the second polar body. Now once that happens, the nucleus of the sperm and ova will begin to swell, forming the male and female pronuclei. The male and female pronuclei will approach one another, and a meiotic spindle will form between them. And finally, the nuclear membranes of the pronuclei will break down, and the chromosomes will intermix. At this point, we can say that fertilization has happened, it's completed, and the next step will be to undergo a mitotic process called cleavage, which we'll talk about in the subsequent slides. So we're going to go through the process of embryonic development in some fairly fine detail. But before I do that, I just want to give you an overview of the steps that are going to occur. So here we are at fertilization. We have a fertilized egg, which is now going to be called a zygote. That zygote is about one-third the way down the fallopian tube. And over the subsequent days, it's going to move down the fallopian tube using the ciliary action of the special ciliated epithelial cells that are lining the fallopian tube. Now, as it moves down that tube, we're going to have a series of mitotic divisions going on, first dividing it into two cells, and then four cells, and then eight cells, and so on and so on. So that eventually, when we're about two-thirds of the way down the tube, we're going to have something called a morula, which is a solid ball of cells. And this morula is going to move into the uterus, and by the time it gets to the uterus, it will be called a blastocyst. And a blastocyst, unlike being a solid ball of cells, is actually a hollow ball of cells consisting of an outer trophoblast and an inner cell mass. And so implantation usually happens at the end of the first week, and we're going to go through each of these events in greater detail in the subsequent slides. So here we are at week one. We've already talked about the process of capacitation and eventually fertilization. So now we're going to go on to the process of cleavage. Once we have that fertilized egg, it's going to be called a zygote. And the first thing that zygote is going to do after fertilization is it's going to begin to divide mitotically. Remember that mitosis produces cells that are genetically identical to one another. And cleavage is a special type of mitosis. Basically, it's a type of mitosis that divides cells into smaller cells, so the cells themselves don't grow before they go through divisions. And so with each cleavage, we're going to get smaller and smaller cells, but the cells are also going to be more numerous. So the first division of the zygote is going to happen within the first day after fertilization, and basically that zygote is going to be divided into blastomeres by the first cleavage. 
and the blastomeres are going to be genetically identical to one another, and also they're going to be half the size of the parent cell. The other thing I want you to realize is that green membrane that's surrounding the blastomeres is basically the shell to the egg, somewhat like the zona pellucida, and eventually we're going to hatch from that shell, but for right now the embryo itself is developing within a shell of acellular protein. Now by day two, the two-celled zygote is going to divide again by cleavage to form a four-cell zygote. And this is going to divide again to yield a solid ball of cells called a morula. So here you can see a little bit of what the fertilized egg and later on embryo actually looks like. At the left-hand side of the screen, you can see the fertilized egg has this shell around it, and you can see there's a large uh, internal mass, and that's the single zygote cell. And then off to the side, you can see a little bitty blip, and that's actually the second polar body. Now, in day one, that fertilized egg, or zygote, is going to undergo the first cleavage to become a two-celled zygote at right. And that two-celled zygote is going to divide, once again, to become a four-celled zygote. And the four-celled zygote is going to divide, become an eight-celled zygote. So you can see that these cells are getting smaller and smaller and smaller with each division. Now, once we get to 16 cells, we're going to form something called a morula. And a morula is a solid ball of cells. So this process of cleavage is going to continue for the next few days, and during this period the zygote is going to be drifting from the fallopian tube towards the uterus. Now by the time we get to the uterus we have a solid ball of cells called our morula, and the morula is going to divide to form something called a blastocyst. Now a blastocyst is a hollow ball of cells which consists of two structures, an inner cell mass, which will eventually become the embryo, and also a trophoblast. The trophoblast will eventually become the chorion, which is basically the embryo's contribution to the placenta. So a blastocyst is basically a hollow ball of cells, which consists of two parts. The inner cell mass, which will go on to become the embryo, and the trophoblast, which will go on to become the embryo's contribution to the placenta. Now it's important to realize that the morula and the blastocyst have, up to this point, been encased by a shell called the zona pellucida. And remember the zona pellucida was a tough acellular protein membrane that surrounded the egg and later on the zygote. And so at around days five to six, cleavage is going to stop and the zygote is going to hatch out of the zona pellucida. And this is absolutely necessary in order for the blastocyst to be able to implant on the side of the uterus. So once that blastocyst hatches from the zona pellucida, it will then be ready to implant on the side of the uterus. And it traditionally does this up towards the fundus, or the upper part of the uterus. And implantation basically involves receptors on both the uterus and the blastula, or blastocyst, that enable the two to bind to one another. And eventually the blastocyst is going to be incorporated into the epithelium of the endometrium and completely covered. Okay, so those were all the events going on during week one. We started out with fertilization, we had cleavage occurring, and eventually we ended up with a morula, a solid ball of cells, which transformed itself into a blastula, or blastocyst, which was a hollow ball of cells. That blastocyst hatched, it shed its zona pellucida, and it entered the uterus and implanted on the side of the uterus. Now in week two, we're going to continue that process of implantation and also have some other changes that are going on as well. So during week two, we're going to have development of the trophoblast. And remember, the trophoblast was that outer ring of cells of the blastocyst that will eventually become the embryo's contribution to the placenta. We're also going to develop the embryonic disc from the inner cell mass. And there will be two layers, the epiblast and the hypoblast. And finally, we're also going to form our extra embryonic membranes. These are the hollow bags, such as the yolk sac and the amnion. And we'll talk about the functions of each of these in the upcoming slides. First, we have to talk about implantation. Now remember that implantation actually started at the end of week one, but it's going to continue into week two as well. And the ring of cells that the embryo is going to use to implant into the uterus is called the trophoblast. And the trophoblast was initially just one ring of cells, and during week two, it's going to differentiate into two different types of cells. There's going to be an inner cytotrophoblast, or cellular trophoblast, and an outer syncytiotrophoblast. Now the syncytiotrophoblast has cells with these abnormal borders, and the job of this structure is going to be to burrow down into the mother's endometrium and start dissolving away some of her cells. Sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? And by dissolving away these cells, we will provide nutrients to the developing embryo.
So initially, we don't have a placenta yet. The way that we provide nutrition to the embryo is basically to dissolve your mom's cells. It's sick. Big picture to remember, though, is that eventually the trophoblast will become the fetus's or embryo's contribution to the placenta, which will form in the upcoming weeks. So here we can see the blastocyst once it binds to the wall of the endometrium. Remember, the endometrium was just that layer of the uterus that builds up every month under the direction of estrogen and progesterone. Our blastocyst consists of a inner cell mass, which will eventually become the embryo, and the trophoblast, which will eventually become the embryo's contribution to the placenta. Now, until we form that placenta, the trophoblast is actually going to differentiate into two types of cells. Here you can see that inner cytotrophoblast or cellular trophoblast, and then an outer syncytiotrophoblast. Remember, it's the job of this syncytiotrophoblast to burrow down into the endometrial cells and dissolve them as it goes along. And these nutrients coming from the dissolved endometrial cells will provide nourishment for the developing embryo. So in summary, implantation starts on day 7 after fertilization and continues through day 12. Now, if you remember, what normally happens in the last 12 to 14 days after ovulation is menstruation. And so at some point, we have to do something to prevent menstruation from occurring. Otherwise, that newly implanted embryo will just be washed out with all the menses. And so one of the things that happens is that we secrete something called human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG. HCG is a hormone that is secreted by the trophoblast of the blastocyst. And this HCG basically causes the corpus luteum to be maintained. And if the corpus luteum is maintained, it's going to continue to secrete progesterone, which will be necessary for maintaining the endometrial lining. And so this slide just shows the picture of a fully implanted embryo. You can see that the embryo consists of a blastocyst, and that the outer ring of that blastocyst consists of something called the syncytiotrophoblast. And those are the cells that have burrowed down into the uterine lining and provided nourishment for the developing embryo. The other thing you should notice is that at this point, we're starting to cover the embryo completely with endometrial cells. So that at the bottom of the screen, you can see an area of uterine tissue that's actually beginning to cover the embryo, and this will be called the decidua capsularis. And the area above that, that is the area that will eventually form the maternal part of the placenta, will be called the decidua basalis. So in the past few slides, we showed you that one of the important things that happens during week two of development is that our trophoblast will differentiate into two cell layers, which will help us with the process of implantation. Now, the second big step that's going to happen is that we will have differentiation of our inner cell mass. And so remember, our inner cell mass is eventually going to become the embryo as well as some of the extra embryonic membranes. And so at the left-hand side of the screen, you can see what the inner cell mass looks like at the time of implantation. Initially, it's just a solid mass of cells on the inside of the blastocyst. Now look what's happened on the right side. You can see that that inner cell mass has differentiated into a two-layer embryonic disc consisting of an upper epiblast and a lower hypoblast. This two-layered embryonic disc will eventually go on to become the embryo. Another step occurring during week two is the formation of the extra embryonic membranes. These consist of the yolk sac, the allantois, and also the amniotic membranes. So on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see a small blue sac forming off the epiblast, and this small blue sac will go on to become the amnion. Now the amnion will grow to eventually surround the entire embryo, and when you hear about somebody's water breaking, we're talking about their amniotic sac rupturing during the final stages of pregnancy. And so the amnion will basically be a water bag that surrounds the embryo and later fetus and prevents it from enduring any type of trauma as the mother moves around. The next extra embryonic membrane that will be formed will be the yolk sac. Now in things like chickens, the yolk sac provides a lot of nutrition for the developing embryo. But because humans are placental mammals, we really don't have much in the way of nutrition inside the yolk sac. Instead, the yolk sac will be important for production of the very first blood cells, and some of the cells of the yolk sac will later go on to become the inside lining of the GI organs. Another membrane coming off the yolk sac is something called the allantois.
So you can see it in the very right hand side of the screen. The Allen Toas is a small projection off the yolk sac that will be used to store liquid wastes and once the placenta is formed it will form the basis for the umbilical cords. Now the other thing I want you to realize in this slide is it shows a time series of the embryo as it implants in the uterus. At the left hand side you can see day 7 that the syncytiotrophoblast cells have begun to invade the endometrium and by day 12 we've started to hollow out little lakes or lacunae in the endometrium which will fill with blood. And by day 16 we have very well developed chorionic villi and chorionic villi are coming off of trophoblast cells off of our blastocyst and the chorionic villi are going to be a means of exchanging nutrients between the lacunae which are filled with maternal blood and also the embryo circulation and it's really important to realize that we don't actually have a mixing of maternal and fetal blood or maternal and embryonic blood but instead that we're transferring nutrients across these very thin membranes that are part of the chorionic villi and remember the chorionic villi themselves were differentiated from the trophoblast move on to week three of embryonic development and there's a whole lot going on during week three we're going to have the processes of gastrulation, neurulation, uh, development of somites, organogenesis and also further development of the chorionic villi and placenta so a very important event going on during week three is something called gastrulation now during gastrulation we will take our two layered embryonic disc and we will basically fold it until we get three layers and these three layers will form ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. And these are the embryonic tissue types that will give rise to all the different tissues in the body. That is the muscle, the connective tissue, and so on. So this slide just shows the functions of the three different tissue types. For example, the outer tissue will become ectoderm. And ectoderm will go on to form the covering of the body, that is the epidermis, and will also go on to form the brain and spinal cord. Now the mesoderm or middle tissue layer will go on to form most of the muscle and connective tissues in the body. One of the first things it will form is a cartilaginous structure called the notochord. And the notochord is basically a primitive vertebral column for the embryo. It will also go on to form smooth muscle as well as the dermis of the skin and many of the internal organs. And finally the third layer will be endoderm and endoderm will become the epithelial lining of the digestive tract and also the endocrine glands. So all of the tissues in the body are either derived from ectoderm, endoderm, or mesoderm. So once gastrulation has occurred, the next process is going to be neurulation. This is basically formation of the neural tube. Now, neural tube is formed from ectoderm called neural plate. And the formation of neural tube from the neural plate occurs in three steps. So the process of neurulation is initiated by chemical signals from the notochord. The notochord is basically just a connective tissue rod right beneath the neural plate and it's primarily made out of cartilaginous tissue. And so under the direction of chemical cues from the notochord, the neural plate will begin to fold into a taco. And this taco will continue to fold until it forms a complete neural tube. And the neural tube again will become the basis for the brain and the spinal cord and remember there's hollow areas inside both the brain and spinal cord and there's also solid areas. The solid areas are basically the cortex of the neural tube and the hollow part of the neural tube is going to persist in the nervous tissue as in the ventricles of the brain or the central canal of the spinal cord. Now once neurulation is completed we will then cover up the brain and spinal cord with epidermis and sometimes it's important to realize that neurulation doesn't go as planned. In order to have successful neurulation, we need lots of folic acid. And if we don't have enough folic acid around, sometimes mistakes are made. These kind of mistakes can manifest themselves in diseases and conditions like spinal bifida. So be sure to read about spinal bifida in your textbook and also read about the need for fetal nutrition and folic acid. So another process happening during week three is the formation of somites. Somite is basically just a body segment and each body segment consists of a myotome composed of muscle, a sclerotome composed of bone, and also a dermatotome composed of overlying skin. And so at the bottom of the slide you can see these segments or somites in probably a three to four week embryo. Another thing that will happen during week three is the development of the internal body cavity called the coelom and organogenesis.
As the name implies, organogenesis is basically the formation of the internal body organs. And for example, we'll form a heart, we'll form blood vessels and things like that. And this involves the differentiation of both endoderm as well as mesoderm. And so we have two different types of mesoderm, one called splanchic mesoderm, which will go on to become the heart and also smooth muscle. And we also have somatic mesoderm, which will go on to become the bones and the ligaments. Now one very important part of organogenesis is the development of the fetal circulation or fetal circulatory system. Now this is happening during the embryonic period. And so the fetal blood cells are initially going to originate from cells produced by the yolk sac. And the blood vessels themselves and heart will be created from mesoderm. And by the end of week three, beginning of week four, we're actually going to have a beating heart. Now this embryo is not going to be breathing in oxygen, but rather it's going to be receiving oxygen through exchange with the placenta. We have some very special structures called vascular shunts. Shunts are basically bypasses that divert blood away from normal circulation. And these include the ductus venosus, which helps to bypass the liver. And the liver is a very important entry and exit point for blood, but it's not actually metabolizing a lot of toxins in here. We're depending mainly on the mother's liver to provide any kind of detoxification. And so we have a shunt in the liver called the ductus venosus. We also have two shunts that basically affect the circulation within the heart. And these include the foramen ovale and the ductus arteriosus. The foramen ovale is basically a hole between the left and right atrium. And it allows blood from the right atrium to bypass the right ventricle and move straight into the left atrium. And in doing so, it bypasses pulmonary circulation. Because remember, where is pulmonary circulation going to? Well, it's going to the lungs. Remember, this embryo doesn't yet have any lungs, and at this point, there's really nothing to breathe anyway. And so we need to divert our blood from the right atrium to the left atrium. The next shunt is called the ductus arteriosus, and this is basically a shunt between the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. Blood that is initially going to be moving from the right ventricle to the pulmonary trunk is diverted directly into the aorta because again there's no reason to go to the lungs because the lungs uh, aren't really well formed yet and they don't have any oxygen to breathe anyway and so the whole point of the foramen ovale and ductus arteriosus is basically to bypass blood from going into the pulmonary circuit so this picture just shows an overview of fetal circulation now remember that the fetus doesn't have any air in its lungs and so there's no real reason to send any blood through the pulmonary circuit and for this reason we have two bypasses or shunts and these include the ductus arteriosus and also the foramen ovale now because there's no air in the fetal lungs we're going to need to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, with the mother through the placenta the placenta is an exchange organ that hasn't really fully formed until about month three but is still very effective at exchanging oxygen and other products uh, earlier on and so blood will basically leave the fetus's body through the umbilical artery the umbilical artery will carry oxygen poor blood away from the fetus to the placenta the placenta will pick up oxygen from the mother circulation and that oxygenated blood will return from the placenta to the fetus via the umbilical vein. So this is another case where we have a vein that actually has oxygen rich blood. Now we don't have time to go through the entire fetal circulation in this presentation so be sure to read about it and be able to diagram it by looking at your textbook. So another thing that's going to happen during the third week of embryonic development is the placenta will begin to develop. And the placenta consists of two parts, the decidua basalis, which is derived from the mother's endometrium, and then the chorionic villi. The chorionic villi are derived from the trophoblast, that is, from the embryo's tissue. So the placenta has several very important functions. Uh, among them are the exchange of gases and also nutrients between the mother and also the fetus. Uh, it also produces hormones and stores some types of nutrients. Now, because the maternal and fetal blood are ideally not mixing, uh, it is also a protective barrier against microorganisms. So although the process of placenta formation starts around week three, it's really going to be going on for the next several weeks, and it doesn't really complete until about three months. And so here you can see the placenta at about four and a half weeks. And so you can see coming off from the embryo, we have several chorionic villi. Chorionic villi are basically made up of embryonic tissue, and they were derived from the trophoblast. And then outside the chorionic villi, we have lacunae that are filled with maternal blood. And on the outside of that, we have the decidua basalis. 
Remember, decidua means falling away from, and the decidua basalis is basically going to make up the maternal portion of the placenta. Now, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you can see something called the decidua capsularis. And so the decidua capsularis is the maternal tissue that covers over sort of the dorsal part of the embryo. Now, as the embryo grows into a large fetus, the decidua capsularis is going to be compressed, and that layer is basically going to break down so that we're no longer going to have chorionic villi in there. It's just going to be a very thin membrane, and that the primary exchange is going to be between the chorionic villi and the decidua basalis. So big picture here is that the placenta has two layers, the chorionic villi and the decidua basalis. The chorion or chorionic villi are derived from the embryo and the decidua basalis are derived from the maternal cells. So as you can see there's a lot going on during week three. Now we're going to start week four. Now the first thing that happens during week four is we have embryonic folding. And this is going to help convert the embryo into a three-dimensional structure. It's also going to help us to form the primitive gut. And by the end of week four we will have totally enveloped our embryo in the amniotic sac. And remember the amniotic sac is basically sort of like an airbag for the embryo or fetus, except in this case this airbag is actually filled with fluid called amniotic fluid, which helps to insulate the fetus inside the uterus. Another thing that will happen during week four is the development of pharyngeal arches. Now pharyngeal arches are also known as branchial arches or gill arches because we see these same types of arches in all types of vertebrates at this point in development and in some vertebrates, for example fishes, these will go on to become gills. Now in humans, of course, we obviously don't have gills and so some of these branchial or pharyngeal arches will go on to make the hyoid bone and will also make up some of the ossicles and the inner ear. So by the time you're born, obviously you shouldn't have any visible external gill arches. So we've had a lot of stuff going on in weeks one through four, so what goes on in weeks five through eight? Well, basically we have a lot of rapid growth and development. The brain has already been formed during week three, is going to continue to grow and develop during the fifth through eight weeks on into the fetal period and then past birth. As that happens, the head's going to grow larger, the limbs are going to enlarge, and digits will appear at those primitive arm and leg buds. We'll also form eyelids over that developing eye, and at some point that postanal tail will disappear as we enter the fetal period. The other thing that begins to appear by the end of the embryonic period is the genitals. Now initially it can be very difficult to distinguish whether they're male or female, but as we get further along into the fetal period it will be much more easy to distinguish the two genders. So that concludes our brief survey of the embryonic period. At week nine we then enter the fetal period. And basically what happens during fetal development is we continue to grow and differentiate all the organs and body systems that were created during the embryonic period. And so even though it's a much longer time period, the fetal period of development is actually a much less complicated. One of the other things that happens in addition to growth and differentiation is an increase in body fat. Initially we start with something low around 5% body fat and by the end of the fetal period we're up to 16% body fat because that's going to be a nice energy reserve and also insulation for the newborn. The other thing that's going to happen is during the last four weeks of fetal development, the testes of male children will descend into the scrotum. And finally, we also need to say that oftentimes we talk about human development as being incomplete. And that's because the brain is not fully formed at the time of birth. The brain in humans will continue to develop during the neonatal period and also during adolescence. So one last thing, if you take a look at the picture right, can you tell me whether this is an embryo or a fetus? Well, if you said fetus, you're correct. It looks kind of like a baby, so it must be a fetus. But in this case, it's not really a human fetus. It's actually a primate fetus. So it's pretty remarkable how similar we look during both embryonic and fetal development. So table 28.1 in your textbook summarizes the major events of the fetal period. So by the end of week 8, we have transitioned from the embryonic period to the fetal period. And you can see that we have something that does look like a baby, albeit the head is a lot larger than it should be. It's about the same size as the body. So one of the important things that happens around 2 months or 8 weeks is that we begin the ossification of the bones. Now if you look at what happens around 9 to 12 weeks or 3 months, uh, notable things are blood cell formation. So initially we were forming red blood cells within the yolk sac, and now blood cells would begin to be formed in the red bone marrow. The other thing is, is that the notochord, that flexible cartilaginous cord that gave the embryo support during the embryonic period, is going to start breaking down and we're going to have ossification of the vertebral centers.
And finally, by the end of three months, you should be able to readily identify the gender of the child from a sonogram. Okay, so by four months, you can see that the fetus has changed in shape drastically. You notice the head is more normal in proportion to the body. The other thing that's going to happen is the kidneys are going to attain their typical size and shape and begin to function. Now during month five, of course, there's lots of important things that are going on, but most notable to the mother is that she will begin to feel spontaneous movements of the fetus in utero. So around six to seven months of development, we're going to get myelination of the spinal cord. The eyes are going to open. In male children, the testes are going to descend into the scrotum. And finally, by month nine, we're going to have deposition of substantial amounts of fat into the hypodermis. Remember, the hypodermis is basically a reservoir for adipose tissue. And by depositing there, not only do we form a substantial energy store, but we're also helping to insulate the potential newborn from big fluctuations in temperature. Because remember, newborns are very, very small, and so small things tend to have greater surface area in proportion to the volume than larger things do. And so they tend to gain and lose heat very easily. And so one way to prevent this is to have adipose tissue to insulate us. So now that we've talked about the fetal and the embryonic periods, we need to shift gears and talk about some of the hormones that regulate pregnancy. The first of these hormones are estrogen and progesterone. Remember, estrogen was necessary for the buildup of the uterine lining, and initially that estrogen was secreted by the developing ovarian follicles. Now, after ovulation, the corpus luteum, that is those remaining follicular cells, would then begin to secrete primarily progesterone, and progesterone was necessary for maintaining the uterine lining and keeping it from menstruating. Now, during pregnancy, this production of progesterone by the corpus luteum will be maintained through the first two months of gestation, but towards the third month of gestation, the placenta will take over that function of secreting progesterone and a little bit of estrogen. Another important hormone for maintaining pregnancy is HCG, or human chorionic gonadotropin. This hormone is produced by the chorion tissue, which surrounds the embryo and later fetus, and it basically acts on the corpus luteum within the ovary, and it basically tells the corpus luteum to continue to produce progesterone. And this progesterone is necessary to maintain the uterine lining and maintain the pregnancy. So this production of progesterone by the corpus luteum will be maintained by the HCG, and this happens until the placenta can later take over estrogen and progesterone secretion, which happens around month three of development. Another hormone that's very important is something called relaxin. Relaxin is produced primarily by the placenta, and one of its actions is to increase the flexibility of the pubic ligaments and also the pubic symphysis. And so basically this widens the birth canal so there will be ample amounts of room for that head to push through the cervix and later through the vagina. Another hormone that is produced is something called human chorionic somatotropin, or HCS. And the sources here are from the placenta, and what it does is prepare the mammary glands for lactation and also regulates maternal metabolism. Okay, another group of hormones that are important in setting the timing of pregnancy are the corticosteroids, cortisol, and also corticotropin-releasing hormone. Now, corticotropin-releasing hormone, or CRH, is produced by the placenta, and it has effects both on the mother and also on the fetus. And the fetus, it stimulates it to secrete its own cortisol, and this cortisol will help to set up the timing of pregnancy by stimulating the uterus, and will also stimulate fetal lung development by causing the development of surfactants. So this slide just shows the relative concentration of different hormones throughout the gestation process. Now remember that ovulation and fertilization ostensibly happen in what we actually call the second week of development, and that's because it's two weeks past the last menstrual period. And so at this time, you can see that initially estrogen is lower than progesterone, and progesterone's higher because it's being secreted by the corpus luteum. Now, as we get into our fourth and eighth and twelfth week of development, you'll see that the levels of human chorionic gonadotropin have skyrocketed. And remember, this hormone is produced by the fertilized egg or zygote, and this hormone basically signals the corpus luteum not to break down. Instead, it stimulates it to produce more and more progesterone. Now, around month three, or around 12 weeks, the placenta has fully formed and will then take over the secretion of progesterone from the corpus luteum. And so levels of progesterone begin to rise. But the other thing you'll also notice is the levels of estrogen will begin to rise a little bit faster. 
in estrogen and progesterone sort of have antagonistic functions on the uterus. Progesterone maintains the uterine lining nice and quiet, whereas estrogen inserts more and more oxytocin receptors into the uterus. And so by the end of the fetal period, we'll have substantial levels of estrogen and slightly declining levels of progesterone. And this is going to make the myometrium of the uterus more sensitive to the hormone oxytocin. So up to this point, we've been focusing primarily on what's going on with the embryo and fetus. But as you're probably aware, the pregnancy also results in some very drastic changes in the anatomy and physiology of the mother. For one, the uterus size changes drastically during pregnancy. Before conception, the female uterus is pretty small, about the size of an inverted pear. However, by the end of the fetal period, the uterus has grown and extended clear all the way up to the xiphoid process. And as it does this, it obviously crowds out many of the other internal organs, including the stomach, bladder, and lungs. There will also be some important metabolic changes and adjustments that occur during pregnancy. For one, the mother must increase her caloric intake by about 300 kilocalories a day. In addition, there will also be elevated levels of PTH and vitamin D to ensure that there's adequate amounts of calcium for the developing embryo and later fetus. In addition, secretion of HPL from the placenta will cause the mother to rely primarily on fatty acids for her own metabolic needs, thereby leaving adequate amounts of glucose in the bloodstream for the embryo and later fetus. In about 10% of pregnancies, mothers will develop something called gestational diabetes as a result of HPL secretion. Now, we used to think that this was only a temporary disorder, but as it turns out, around 50% of mothers who develop gestational diabetes will later go on to develop type 2 diabetes later in life. And of course, in addition to all those metabolic changes, there are going to be some substantial physiological changes in the mother's body as well. The most drastic of these changes are seen in the cardiovascular system. The blood volume is going to increase by 40% and the cardiac output can increase by as much as 30%. The respiratory system is also affected. Uh, we expect to see tidal volume increase up to 30-40% to 40 to deal with the extra oxygen demands of the fetus. And of course the gastrointestinal system will also be affected. The appetite is going to obviously increase, but the motility of the GI tract will decrease, which frequently leads to constipation. Heartburn or acid reflux is also common as the uterus often pushes up and displaces many of the GI organs out of their normal positions. Now, we already said that the uterus changes drastically in size, but here you can see just how drastically. Prior to conception, the uterus was a very small organ, around 80 grams, whereas at the end of the nine-month period, the uterus is going to weigh more than 1,200 grams, or 1.2 kilograms. That is a tremendous change in size. And finally, the urinary system is also impacted. There is both increased renal flow and also micturation, and many women may develop periodic incontinence as a result of these fluctuating hormone levels and also the added pressure of the uterus on the bladder. As you are probably aware, there are several disorders that can occur during the latter stages of pregnancy, and one of the more common and serious conditions is called preeclampsia. This condition causes reduced blood flow to the placenta, which can starve the fetus for oxygen. The mother often becomes hypertensive and edematous, and oftentimes large amounts of protein are excreted in the urine. This is called proteinuria. If preeclampsia progresses to eclampsia, life-threatening seizures may result. It is believed that preeclampsia is caused by an immune reaction against fetal cells that somehow enter maternal circulation. Aside from immediate delivery of the fetus, there is no definitive cure or treatment for preeclampsia. Other types of disorders include the development of fetal birth defects, many of which can be caused by maternal exposure to teratogens. Teratogens are substances which may cause severe congenital abnormalities or even death in a fetus. A common teratogen is ethyl alcohol. Mothers who consume alcohol, particularly during the first few weeks of pregnancy, run a much greater risk of having a child with fetal alcohol syndrome. Fetal alcohol syndrome children typically have a small head, mental retardation, and abnormal growth. Oftentimes they can be identified by their widely spaced eyes and smooth upper lip, which lacks the philtrum that is characteristic of normal babies. Other examples of teratogens include medications, such as the drug thalidomide, which was used to treat morning sickness in the late 1950s and early 60s. This led to birth defects in over 10,000 children worldwide, 
Most of the children affected by this drug were born with severely deformed appendages, as indicated by the picture at the lower right. Now, fortunately, thalidomide was never approved for use in the United States. Nonetheless, it does illustrate the importance of consulting closely with your physician about any drugs or medications that you plan to take during your pregnancy. So now we're going to shift gears once again and talk about the process of parturition. Parturition, or labor, is the process of giving birth to a baby. Now, from what we understand, the onset of labor is actually determined by the fetus, not by the mother. Late in pregnancy, the fetus will secrete increasing amounts of cortisol, which stimulates the placenta to secrete large amounts of estrogens. These estrogens stimulate the myometrial cells of the uterus to develop numerous oxytocin receptors, and it also antagonizes progesterone's quieting effect on the uterus. As a result, the myometrium becomes more and more irritable. As labor nears, the fetus will then secrete oxytocin and the placenta will secrete prostaglandins both of which stimulate smooth muscle contraction in the uterus, causing strong rhythmic muscle contractions, signaling the onset of true labor. Now, once begun, these contractions will initiate a positive feedback loop between the hypothalamus and pituitary and the myometrium of the uterus, and this will eventually facilitate the delivery of the child. And we will describe this positive feedback mechanism in the next slide. So this slide shows the positive feedback mechanism controlling labor. Remember that towards the end of pregnancy, we have very high levels of estrogen and declining levels of progesterone. One of progesterone's function was to quiet the uterus and keep it from contracting. So as progesterone declines and estrogen increases, we in fact insert more oxytocin receptors in the wall of the myometrium, the uterus. Now, as the embryo starts to secrete oxytocin, this will stimulate mild uterine contractions and as the uterus contracts, it will force the head of the baby against the cervix. Now this stimulation will feed back via nerve impulses to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus will stimulate the posterior pituitary to secrete more oxytocin. More oxytocin results in more contractions. It also results in the production of prostaglandins, which stimulate very, very powerful contractions of the uterus. And so this positive feedback mechanism will continue to snowball on itself until such time where we generate very large contractions that are sufficient enough to deliver the fetus. Now, as you're probably aware, the onset of uterine contractions doesn't mean you should go running to the hospital. And that's because labor actually occurs in three stages. And the first of these stages is quite long, somewhere between 6 to 12 hours in length. And this is called the stage of dilation. And basically, this is the time between the start of contractions and complete dilation of the cervix. Remember that the cervix was the junction between the uterus and the vagina, and that initially the cervix is a very tiny opening, but as we go through the process of dilation, it will open to a maximum diameter of 10 centimeters. At this point, we say that the woman is fully dilated, and around the time of dilation, we're going to have the breaking of the waters or rupture of the amniotic sac. So once the cervix completely dilates to 10 centimeters, we'll then enter the next stage of labor, called the stage of expulsion. And this is the stage at which we're going to actually deliver the fetus or baby. Now, depending on the mother, the stage of expulsion can be a very short period, as short as 10 to 20 minutes, to a very long period, up to a couple of hours. And during this period, we have increased muscular contractions, which are forcing the fetus through the pelvic canal. And during this time, the fetus, of course, is being compressed. It's enduring a lot of stress, which is inducing the secretion of epinephrine, norepinephrine, and also cortisol in the fetus. And this is helping to prepare the lungs of the fetus to deal with the outside world. And the final stage of labor is the placental stage, or delivery of the afterbirth. And this typically occurs between 20 to 30 minutes after the delivery of the fetus. And basically what happens is we have continued smooth muscle contraction within the myometrium, and this smooth muscle contraction basically shears off the placenta from the uterus. So this slide just shows another example of the process of labor. Remember that labor has three stages, and these include the dilation stage, expulsion stage, and placental stage. So if you take a look at 1A, we have early dilation. Basically, muscular contractions of the uterus are forcing the baby's head against the cervix. And this is causing nerve impulses to travel from the mother's cervix to the hypothalamus, which is causing release of oxytocin from the posterior pituitary. Now, the oxytocin causes more muscular contractions, again, forcing the baby's head further down into the cervix, which stimulates more nerve impulses and more muscular contraction. 
eventually the cervix is going to fully dilate to about 10 centimeters. In this case, the baby's head is going to engage the pelvic canal. And at this point, we're going to transition into the second stage called expulsion. And this is the period where the baby's head is actually forced through the pelvic canal out of the vaginal opening. Now the baby's head is probably the largest and widest part of the baby and so once that part of the baby has been delivered, delivery of the rest of the baby is quite easy. And finally, after that baby has been delivered, we're then going to enter the placental stage. And this is a time period of about 20 to 30 minutes where continued muscular contractions are shearing off the placenta from the uterine wall and causing it to be expelled through the vaginal canal. So after expulsion of the fetus, there are going to be some immediate physiological changes which transition that fetus from depending on basically receiving nutrients and gases from the placenta to being able to breathe on its own. And so one of the first cues is going to be rising amounts of carbon dioxide in the fetal circulation. Now this is going to cause a breathing reflex. Basically the alveoli which have been previously collapsed are going to fill up as that baby depresses its diaphragm and fills the lungs for the first time. Now initially the breathing rate of the baby is going to be very fast, around 45 breaths per minute, and that's going to decrease over the successive days and weeks. Another thing that's going to happen soon after delivery is the closure of the circulatory shunts. Remember the circulatory shunts were basically diverting blood away from the normal circulatory pattern. And these include the umbilical vessels, the foramen ovale, and also the ductus arteriosus. Remember that the umbilical vessels were carrying oxygen-poor blood from the fetus to the placenta. But now that the placenta is no longer there, the umbilical vessels will constrict and they will eventually become filled in with connective tissues. Now let's take a look at the shunts within the heart and also the great blood vessels. The foramen ovale, if you remember, was basically the hole between the left atrium and right atrium and allowed a lot of blood to bypass the pulmonary circuit. But now that we no longer have a placental connection, we need to make sure we do send blood through the pulmonary circuit so that we can oxygenate that blood and get rid of CO2. So one of the first things that's going to happen is the foramen ovale will snap shut there's basically a valve-like flap that will cover up the foramen ovale and in the successive days and weeks that flap will be covered over with fibrous connective tissue. Another thing that's going to happen is we're going to have closure of the ductus arteriosus. Remember the ductus arteriosus was basically a bypass between the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. But now that the fetus is not in utero and we have to send blood to the lungs, we are going to have muscular constriction of the ductus arteriosus and just like the umbilical vessels, this vessel will be filled in with fibrous connective tissue. So once the fetus is delivered and begins to breathe on its own, it will now be called a neonate. The neonatal period lasts for about four weeks. Obviously one thing that we'll need to do for a neonate is provide an ample source of nutrition so that it will continue to grow and develop. So for the first several months of the baby's life, this nutrition will come from lactation or milk production by the mother. Now lactation actually has two stages. The first of these is milk production proper and this occurs in the alveolar cells of the mammary tissue and is stimulated by the production of prolactin from the anterior pituitary. The second step, the milk letdown reflex, is caused by smooth muscle contraction within the mammary tissues. This muscular contraction is in fact stimulated by the release of oxytocin from the posterior pituitary. Now it is important to understand that the secretion of both prolactin and oxytocin is stimulated by the suckling of the newborn on the nipple of the breast. If a mother suckles her young diligently each day, it is possible to prolong the period of lactation from several months to up to a few years. So this slide just shows the sequence of events necessary for production of milk and also for letdown of milk. So let's start on the left hand side of the screen. So we initially start out with stimulation of the mechanoreceptors in the nipples caused by the suckling of the infant on the nipple. And this is going to cause the hypothalamus to release something called prolactin releasing factor, otherwise known as prolactin releasing hormone. And this is going to travel from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary where it will stimulate the anterior pituitary to secrete prolactin. And prolactin will travel through the bloodstream to the mammary tissue of the breast where it will stimulate milk production by the alveolar cells. Now let's start again at the left hand side of the screen. The other thing that suckling will stimulate is it will stimulate the hypothalamus to send nerve impulses to the posterior pituitary. 
Now remember that the posterior pituitary was where oxytocin was stored. And so when oxytocin is released from the posterior pituitary, it will travel through the bloodstream to the myoepithelial cells in the breast where it will stimulate the milk letdown reflex. Now it's important to remember that the milk letdown reflex is actually a positive feedback loop. Now as you're probably aware, the first milk produced by the breast is called colostrum. Colostrum actually has less nutritional value than normal milk as it is low in lactose and contains virtually no fat. However, colostrum is nonetheless very important as it contains proteins, vitamins, and is particularly rich in immunoglobulins. These immunoglobulins can cross the mucosal membrane and enter the bloodstream of the neonate. And these immunoglobulins enable the neonate to acquire a temporary passive immunity to antigens to which the mother has been previously exposed. Now, although this immunity is short-lived, it does allow the neonate to be protected from many types of pathogens while its own immune system matures and develops. Now, in the last slide, we talked about the components of colostrum, which was the first breast milk, and now we're going to talk about the components of normal breast milk. So, normal breast milk has a lot of nutrients in there. Principally, we have lipids, we have carbohydrates, and we also have proteins. And most pediatricians will agree that human breast milk is superior to both cow's milk and goat's milk in providing a well-balanced nutrient source to the newborn. There are also other molecules in there as well. Of course, there's antibodies that we talked about in the previous slide. These are principally IgA antibodies, which can cross the mucosal membrane and confer a temporary passive immunity to the newborn for things that the mother has encountered during her lifetime. And, of course, there are also cells in there as well. We're talking about white blood cells and also epithelial cells. Now, it's important to realize that these cells tend to be too large to cross the mucosal membrane. And so even though we have some great white blood cells in there, they really serve no effect at helping to defend the newborn against any type of infections because they cannot cross the mucosal membrane. Okay, you have now reached the end of the lecture on pregnancy, labor, and human development. There are a few review questions included at the end of this lecture, so be sure you complete them before going on to take this week's Laulima quiz. Of course, you should also be sure to read Chapter 28 if you have not done so already. In particular, be sure to read the section on assisted reproductive technology included at the end of the chapter, as this was not covered in the lecture, but may still show up on the exam.